franchising is coming to the NALCS for the 2018 season, and it's going to bring sweeping changes to the competitive esports scene. What? Absolutely insane. So what does all this mean for your favorite teams and players? Well, no one really knows for sure, but we do have some initial guesses. For one, we think it's likely that the oldest and most popular franchises will be here to stay in some form or another. It's also pretty clear that Riot aren't here to just claim the highest dollar possible on its LCS spots, as their initial $10 million flat fee is, by most estimates, much lower than what it could attract in the open market. Some teams will have uh, to go out and raise money and sell off equity in order to pay for the franchise fees. And if they do that, I have no doubt that there's going to be a ton of interest from the investment space, especially given the fact that the franchise cost is in my belief uh, significantly lower than what could have been charged and successfully sold by Riot. Secondly, with permanent partnership and revenue sharing, it's likely that your favorite teams are going to get bigger. The financial benefits to growing a team's brand are now passed on to everyone, including Riot Games, meaning that the growth of each individual brand in the LCS will be beneficial to all. This means that even if I'm CLG, the growth of TSM could also be in my best interest. Lastly, your favorite players could be around longer, be more accessible, and have more to say in how the league is run, and that's a good thing because, you see, this hasn't always been the case. Here's TSM's owner Reginald in the summer of 2016, talking about player burnout and the effects of poorly timed patch changes by Riot. If you're like a doctor and you practice your profession for 10 years, you become like a master at what you do. But in LCS, it, it's not rewarding because from a pro player standpoint, you learn something, you're really good at it, and then you basically lose everything that you've learned in the last year. I think that's like a big reason why you see a lot of player burnout. And from an owner perspective and a player perspective, it's honestly really discouraging. As discouraged as Reginald was at the state of the LCS in 2016, there was once a time when League of Legends was just a game with a humble grassroots esports movement. Reginald was just a kid playing his favorite game, and the idea of it being a big business was a pipe dream. TSM cement themselves as the most dominant organization in North American League of Legends and win their fourth North American Championship! championship. Looking back at 2010 to 2011, the competitive League of Legends circuit consisted almost entirely of tournaments organized by third parties such as ESL, MLG, WCG, and IGN. And League of Legends itself was really just an afterthought compared to the more popular games of the time like StarCraft II, Counter-Strike, and Call of Duty. Even Dota 2 brought in more tournament earnings in 2011 with their first ever, the International Tournament, with what was at the time an absolutely insane $1.6 million prize pool. And Dota 2 wasn't even in beta yet. However, it didn't take long for League of Legends to gain traction in the esports arena. By the end of 2011, a combination of the game's increasing popularity and the competitive circuit's success propelled League of Legends into the forefront. 180 something thousand viewers? Ridiculous! I mean, we were expecting something like that for the grand finals, maybe, but wow! In 2012, the number of tournaments more than quadrupled in both Europe and North America. Total prize pool earnings reached more than $4 million, and League of Legends would solidify itself as the most played PC game in the world. With a constantly increasing number of its massive player base interested in the competitive scene, Riot took a leap of faith. In August of 2012, they announced their plans for a privately run league, the League of Legends Championship Series. This is a groundbreaking moment in league history, the official start of the League of Legends Championship Series. The 2013 Spring Split was a great success with plenty of great plays and storylines alike, but the fun truly began in the playoffs. I'm scared of playoffs. Playoffs is like, it's you can lose your job, you can go to relegation. Two incredible upsets by relative new kids on the block, Vulcan and GGU, forced CLG and Dignitas, two of the most established and popular teams at the time, to fight for their lives in the first ever relegation promotion tournament. If we lose this, the team will not continue. I guarantee you. 
In relegations, CLG and Dignitas both managed to survive into the summer split, taking down Team Summon and Azure Cats, respectively. Don't think there's enough defense here for the rest of Azure Cats. CLG with a 3-0 sweep will make their way back into the LCS summer split. The success of the first promotion relegation tournament proved to many that the relegation system was an effective method of sparking competition. But the sheer thought of famed teams like CLG and Dignitas at risk of losing it all was a devastating thought to the fans of both teams. Your team does nothing for six, nine months, and that would be horrible. Like Our team would disband if that happened. Two teams that had at one time been major forces in the competitive League of Legends scene were on the brink of losing everything they had worked for. It's a terrifying feeling knowing you could drop down. The last game of the season may be the most important game for us. The stakes were astronomically high and everything was on the line. In 2014, Riot Games implemented the Challenger Series, which would act as a second tier of competition, as well as being a pathway for amateurs to enter the LCS, and this change became the catalyst for the most interesting storyline of the year, the emergence of LMQ. In pursuit of the American dream, the all-Chinese lineup spearheaded by star mid laner Xiao Wei Xiao made their way over to the United States. Breezing through the ranked 5v5 ladder, LMQ made their way to the Challenger Series where they dominated the field. And that's the 3-0! LMQ are in the LCS! Even after they qualified for the LCS, the team would not let up. On the LCS stage, LMQ showed off their uniquely aggressive playstyle based around the superior mechanical skill of their individual players and their uncanny ability to cause chaos, then thrive within that chaos. The LCS had a new team of superstars and it propelled them to the top of the NA LCS standings. Baron is remarkably dangerous. Oh my uh, word. Oh my word, no way! What a play! Ackerman just completely outplays Saren! Even when their organization's very public ownership dispute began to plague the team off the rift, the team continued to achieve on the rift. Through their resilience, the team realized their dream of participating in the 2014 World Championships, and for Riot, LMQ should have been the perfect display of what the Challenger Series could stand for. But there was a problem. The LMQ lineup was all Chinese. Due to LMQ's dominance in the NA LCS, Riot implemented an interregional movement policy that would make it impossible for another LMQ-esque team to emerge ever again. But this wouldn't be the only major change to hit the LCS before the start of the 2015 season. A league-wide expansion increased the number of teams from 8 to 10. A brand new promotion relegation rule saw the 10th place LCS team automatically relegated in place of the first place challenger team, and a new sale of sponsorship rule forced some of the league's oldest organizations to rebrand. When the decision came to not continue with a Curse Inc. title sponsorship, uh, I had a few options. I could have decided to rebrand the team, you know, new logo, look and feel. Uh, I could have decided to find a new title sponsorship for the team or find an organization that kind of just gelled with not having an LCS presence. So Team Liquid was just the obvious choice. Although the expansion teams failed to make a significant splash in the league, the 2015 season was still one to be remembered. CLG hoisted the NA LCS trophy for the first time in the organization's long competitive history. It's, it's truly magical to be here. Thank you. And Cloud9's Miracle Gauntlet run set the stage for an epic 2015 World Championship group stage. A triple kill for Balls! Holy cow! Oh, I got to get a kill! kill for Balls! Holy cow! 2016 would be the year of esports, and the LCS saw a massive influx of both interest and investments. A plethora of notable organizations and sports stars like the Philadelphia 76ers, FC Schalke, Rick Fox, Alex Rodriguez, Shaq, and Magic Johnson would all be invested in the space by the end of the year. With the influx of outside investments and the growth of the esports industry as a whole, the discussion of sustainability, stability, and future investment opportunities of the LCS model came into question. The guy, a lot of the guys that are investing into this, they are not able to build a stable organization because the board's always moving, right? And they don't understand how to like go towards like the moving target. But because like the, the target's always moving and they can also like lose 
their spot, it's it's volatile. So I would just prefer something more stable. After Reginald's statements went viral, the LCS relegation system and the possibility of franchising became the community's hottest topics. And why the LCS owners are saying that they want permanent slots is because we have all experienced sponsors saying to us, uh, well, relegation exists, so we can't really justify this kind of level of spending for this sponsorship. What happens if you get knocked out? Then we're on the hook for this contract, etc., etc. In November of 2016, clearly frustrated by the current state of the LCS, 18 teams signed off on a letter that addressed their concerns about finances, revenue sharing, and relegation from the league and offered possible solutions to their concerns. The North American team owners eventually got their wish when Riot announced their plan to become permanent partners with both the teams and players on June 1st, 2016. We're going to be sharing revenue with teams and pros. We're going to be establishing a players association to support and protect pros. And we're going to be changing the structure of the league to remove relegation because we believe it will unlock future investment and also make the overall league more competitive. Set to kick off for the 2018 spring split, teams who have been approved by Riot to become partners for the 2018 season will have a permanent spot in the NALCS, meaning teams will no longer have to juggle uncertainty when investing in the LCS and their players. Then again, we may also never see moments like this again. Cooper's going to fall over, they're going to keep moving forward, Nick Wu falls down, MIA falls down, this is most certainly going to be the game, this could be Quantic 3-0 going into the LCS Summer Split. This doesn't necessarily mean that the league is doomed to be less competitive. Riot has decided that of the 32.5% revenue share allotted to teams, Half of that will be distributed equally amongst teams, while the other half will be distributed amongst teams based on their regular season placing. A higher place finish means more money. Not only will there be more financial incentive to winning, there will be a financial penalty to losing. Consistently placing in the bottom two spots will result in escalating financial penalties. And if you finish within the bottom two slots for five of eight splits, you could lose your spot in the league. It won't just be the teams that'll enjoy a share of revenue generated by the new franchising system though. The players themselves will be entitled to a 35% cut with an increased guaranteed minimum salary of $75,000 a year. Riot will also be launching a players association to help give the players a larger say in how the league is run and also provide essential resources such as legal aid, financial planning, and skills training. Not only that, the Challenger Series will be getting a facelift, becoming a strictly developmental league tied to LCS franchises. This means teams will have a deeper roster pool, a place where they can invest in and grow their own talent. Although it's really tough to say right now exactly how it'll all work out, the prospect of sustained security and stability is exciting, not only for the league, teams, and players, but for the fans as well. Thanks for watching. If you want more great content, be sure to hit that subscribe button.